So as we mentioned, so I'm James and this is Sean. We both work with mental health and addiction services. Um, and I do prevention and health promotion work. So it's a really broad uh, area. We do some policy work. We work with workplaces. We do a lot of work with schools uh, and do targeted programming for adolescents and for youth. Um, and we do presentations to adult groups like this as well. So what we're hoping to do today is we're going to get you up and moving around. And this is a larger group than we anticipated. So we might take a group of individuals rather than everybody for all of we'll the activities. The volunteers as we go. We'll talk about the challenge by choice as well for activities. But yeah. So I'm going to do a little bit of a PowerPoint, but we really don't want to do too much PowerPoint. We want to get people up and moving around. Um, and because it's adventure-based learning, which you'll hear more about, how many people are aware of adventure-based learning? Is that a few people? One, two, OK, three. <laughs> um, a big component of adventure-based learning is challenge by choice. And Sean will be talking a lot more about that. But it's really providing uh, students and providing individuals the autonomy to make decisions um, throughout the learning process. So I think that may be really interesting and really helpful with the, the population group that you use. So we're going to do the presentation, and then we're going to do some activities. But I'm gonna, I would like a group of volunteers could be five, could be 15, to just kind of approach the front. I'm going to start with an icebreaker, um, which is around agree, disagree. So if I can get some volunteers to come on up. And you're all educators, so you're all keen to volunteer? Yeah. <laughs> so this activity, and I'm, I'm condensing a little bit, but um, I often do this when I'm starting a presentation, uh, and it's called Strongly Agree, Strongly Disagree. And you may have done something similar. So I'm going to read a statement, and you're going to place yourself accordingly, whether you strongly agree or whether you strongly disagree. And if you have no opinion or you don't care, you can stand in the middle. You're allowed to do that. So um, let's start with an easy one. So substance use uh, is a problem in my community. Do you agree with that statement or disagree? Excellent. So the second part of the um, activity that I didn't tell you about is I'd like you to explain, and not everybody has to do this, but explain why you're standing where you're standing. <coughs> Put us right on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> so why did you, why did you strongly my, agree with my that community statement? That I'm, uh, my community of learners, substance abuse is a big problem. I've got people that are in the midst of addictions, and I've got people that are recovering from addictions with treatment. Yeah. So it's always a big issue in my classroom. Yeah, and that's actually one of the statements I was going to use, that it's really the biggest presenting issue that you see um, within the work that you do in terms of adult learning quite often. Is that fair enough to say? Any other comments people want to make in terms of how they see substance use in their community? Yeah? Well, I think it's one of the big reasons why I'm there, that a lot of learners that should be or would be in my classroom aren't in my classroom. Right. So it's also the thing that prevents people yeah. from getting a full education or, or maybe not. Or yeah. Yeah, and, and also that um, uh, it's, they're a difficult to, that group of individuals are a difficult group to engage as well, right? So quite often um, they may not be able to follow through. They may be doing programs over and over again. So there's a lot of recidivism or returning back. Is that fair? Yeah, a lot of what you two said, it's a huge barrier where I work as well to learning. Um, much with, with people dealing with that, it's very difficult for them to focus on education and whatnot, right? Yeah. So. Excellent. Great points. Um, so let's try a second comment, a little bit more controversial maybe. Um, most people can take care of addictions themselves. Would you agree with that statement or disagree? You are a very uniform group. <laughs> 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 so explain why you're standing where you're standing. You need support when dealing with addictions. Yeah. That's why I'm here. Yeah, in small community, sometimes it's hard to break away from the pack and, and do your and find the positive supports. That's right. Yeah. So finding supports around you for sure. Now you're kind of in the middle, bit of an outlier. Uh, it's, it's hard to know. It's. I just think it's hard to know. Um, what's true for most people. Right. You know, I, I used to smoke. I quit on my own. Uh, and I found it helpful not to tell anyone or 
for not for anyone to know. Yeah. And so, but I don't think that works for most people. But uh, on the other hand, sometimes I think I don't know. It's just such a problematic and individual thing to yeah. deal with an addiction. So uh, I really don't know what's true for most people. And as somebody who works at mental health and addiction services, I would actually be on this side. Because considering the amount, and I'm sorry, I'm, I have my back to people. I don't realize I'm doing that. Um, but considering the, the rate of addiction and the number of people who are uh, difficultly involved in substance use, our numbers of clients who come forward is actually pretty small in relation to the problem. So from our perspective, most people do take care of it on their own, but they do it with a lot of support and a lot of different groups, right? So, so I'll do one more statement. Um, cannabis or marijuana should be legalized. Do you agree with that statement or do you disagree with that should statement? Should be legalized? Sh cannabis should be, should be legalized. Oh, should be legalized. Yeah, should be made legal. Exactly. <laughs> exactly in the middle. <laughs> That's interesting. I, and I love doing this activity. Like, I do this activity with different groups and different populations, so it's always interesting to see where people place themselves. So why are you standing where you're standing? It depends what you mean by legal. Like totally open, wild and crazy. You know, everybody, anybody can get it any time. Colorado or legal. Restricted. Yeah. Restricted so it would be for like, like liquor. Let's say like alcohol. Oh. You're gonna move over further. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think part of the reason why we're having so much of a problem with addictions is because they're criminalized and people aren't able to treat their problems as personal, psychological, medical, mental problems instead of uh, being treated as a criminal problem. So, so whatever, people aren't allowed to, you know, um, make choices right. for themselves, what works for them, what doesn't. So. Great, thank you. I think there are a lot of fallacies on both sides of the argument, mm. so because I'm not that familiar with either the extremes of it, uh, I have a hard time coming up with the I'm over here or over here. Yeah. I, I agree. I, I, I see both sides of it, you know, yeah. like there's, um, I remember reading, there's a lot more teenagers now experiencing onset of psychosis from marijuana, right? But then I also know some people that it really helps them focus. It, it, it works positively for them. So, um, you know. I, and it's true. And there's a lot of rhetoric around uh, marijuana or cannabis right now. So we're not getting a clear message about what's happening. But you know, society, the culture has already moved very far ahead. And there is legalization in certain states. So really, this is happening really quickly. But we don't know what the impacts are going to be as that moves forward, right? So it's interesting you guys are kind of, it's a nice grouping because there's some, you're all kind of in the middle but don't have a clear answer. You can imagine if I asked this question or that made this statement to a group of adolescents where they fall, um, they're really polarized, right? So either they really agree or they really disagree, which is really interesting. So, okay, give, give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you very much. So hopefully as we do uh, these activities, you'll have a sense about um, where you could use them within your own uh, classes or within opportunities, or you may have already done this before. I think that's an amazing icebreaker because it allows people to participate without having to uh, engage fully. So some people may just stand and move. Some people may just stand in the middle the whole time. Some people are real talkers and they'll talk all the time. So I think it really gives an opportunity for everybody to participate in activity without necessarily um, being fully engaged or having to engage in all parts of it. So it's a great, I, I do it all the time. So because we're with addiction, oh, that's okay. So because we're with addiction services, I felt like we needed to talk just a little bit about what the current data is and stats are around substance use and mental health issues. So in uh, mental health and addiction services, now we're with the health authority, we're across the province, so every health authority uh, are slightly different in terms of their approach, but we all provide the same comprehensive range of services. So that includes individual and group counseling, there's um, uh, counseling specifically for youth, for women, uh, and for individuals harmfully involved with gambling. So Sean is a uh, community outreach worker for adolescents. We also have a clinical therapist who works with adolescents as well. And he'll tell you a little bit more about what that means. Um, 
We do mandatory but m referrals, but also voluntary referrals. So most of our um, referrals are self, uh, individuals can refer themselves. Uh, the only mandatory referrals are really people who are going through the driving while impaired program. Um, probations. And probations as well, thank you. Um, we offer things like smoking cessation, uh, prevention promotion work, which is what I do, acupuncture. So it's really a great resource um, for, uh, for your students, but also for you to learn more about, in, you're probably aware of mental health and addiction services, but um, we do offer a range of services and we really do try to work with community. That's a big part of where we come from. So for, why are we talking about addiction services and mental health? Well, we've already answered the question, right? So. Um, one of the things that prevents people from getting education or being um, engaged fully in the uh, education system is often the issue around concurrent disorders. And we're starting to talk a lot more about concurrent disorders. So two years ago, Sean and I worked for addiction services. And within the last couple of years, we've integrated mental health and addictions because we were often seeing people fall through the cracks where individuals who had a mental health problem were not being seen because they, were, they were also had an addiction problem. So whose responsibility is that? Well, it's both of our responsibilities, really. So we're moving towards that place. And most, I would say, all um, services in the province are now integrated mental health and addiction services. So just some stats around mental health, and you've probably heard these before, but one in five Canadians will experience a mental illness in their lifetime. 70% of mental health problems and illnesses have their onset during childhood or adolescence. Most young people, or not most, sorry, young people between the ages of 15 and 24 are more likely to report mental illness and or substance use disorders than other age groups. So often the age of onset for uh, some mental, mental health issues and mental illnesses happen around that 15 to 24 year old uh, time frame. Uh, so you can see how that can impact uh, somebody's education. And Canadians in the lowest income group are three to four times more likely than those in the highest income group to report fair to poor mental health. So it's not new information, but it's good to kind of have that in context in terms of um, what, where people are. And if people have any comments or questions as I'm going through, feel free to just interrupt me. From my, from my, so the question is, uh, see, I'm remembering how to do this. So the question is uh, whether people who are in higher income brackets are able to take care of themselves or have more supports. For me, I look at it from a public health lens or a social determinants of health. So individuals who are in higher income levels uh, often have better rates of literacy, they have better employment, they have better housing, um, so, and they're able to have a support system that, that provides them support rather than individuals who are in lower income brackets. But it's a great, great point to raise. So in our office, what do we see in terms of substance use? Just so you get a sense about um, what the realities are. Well, it hasn't really changed in terms of why people present to our organization. The top three drugs are alcohol, <coughs> cannabis, and tobacco. Um, and that's been true since we've been surveying uh, students and surveying adults. Uh, and in terms of what we see coming through our office, the reality, or what we hear in media quite often, are all of these other drugs. We especially hear about things like emerging drugs, like salvia uh, or bath salts. But in terms of the number of people coming through our office, it's really the top three drugs that uh, are still the, the most popularly used. Do you want to make any comment about yeah, any of those substances? It would still be alcohol, cannabis, and tobacco would be the main three. Um, but in our particular area, I would say the one that's on the rise the most would be for, um, misuse of prescription medication for adolescents. Uh, and that can go as far as actually injecting medications as well. Yeah. Which is new within the last, last few year, years. So to our, to our, yeah, for our services anyways. Especially in rural communities. You don't expect, it was a surprise for me when I started to hear that was becoming more commonplace. Yeah. And this gets back to one of the questions that you asked, but um, are there any stats to show that No, and mainly because they've been uh, a legally obtained substance for so long, there wouldn't have been record of, of stats keeping before that time. So it's interesting when we, because when you place this in context with cannabis, the big issue for me around cannabis is around unintended consequences, right? So what happens when you legalize a substance that hasn't been legalized before? Um, the 
from law enforcement perspective, there's a real concern that rates are going to increase dramatically, and we don't have social supports in place for that. So. Bath salts are a very, there's a new class of, of drugs called designer drugs, um, and bath salts is one of those. So within the last couple of years, so for people who are utilizing substances, there's a classification system, right? So most drugs are on the classification, which makes them illegal that you can prosecute. Dealers and producers are now getting smart to that, and they're actually designing new chemical combinations um, that aren't on the classification. So bath salts are an example of that. I have a picture of it that I can show you really quickly. Um, but it comes into the country and it's actually legal for a period of time because it's not on the classification. So bath salts came in about two years ago. It's a horrendous drug, uh, which is kind of a combination of an amphetamine and a hallucinogen uh, and was doing some real damage. We were seeing it a lot in Picto, for example, in one area. But the government moved really quickly to... to uh, limit its use and to uh, make it illegal. That's right. Yeah, yeah, and that and that's kind of a common street term. And I don't. Do you remember the name of it offhand? It's a long. It's a name, long. It actually looks like bath salts too. That's how they were shipping it. That's why I got the name bath salts. I was wondering how. It would have yeah. Yeah. And you had to comment about. It? So salvia, yeah. Salvia is a form of, so that's an interesting contrast, right? So salvia is a form of sage. It's actually a dried plant that you can, don't tell anybody, but you can, draw, you can buy it in um, gardening centers. And you can dry it and smoke it, and it gives a very powerful, very short high. So it's interesting to contrast the two because bath salts kind of came and went really quickly and got a lot of press. There was, you might remember somebody ate somebody's, somebody's face at one time. That didn't have anything to do with bath salts, but there's a lot of media, around, media attention to that. Salvia has been around for a long time, hasn't gained as much media attention, but in some ways is as dangerous. So, you know, there's, there's a real cultural piece to all of this as well in terms of what makes the most noise. So, so how common are the last They're not particularly common. That's why I kind of place them in terms of order of use. Um, but among adolescent populations, we would see more use of designer drugs or drugs like salvia because kids are more apt to experiment. And do you have a comment or no? Okay, great. I'm gonna. I want to try and whip rip through this because we promised we would be doing activity stuff. So I want to make sure we can do that. Um, I've already mentioned this, but in terms of rates of student use. Um, you can see how high the rates are. Now, I've actually classified caffeine as a drug, or um, which is a little bit controversial because it's so widely available. But we're starting to have really interesting conversations with adolescents about caffeine, the role of caffeine, and the impact of caffeine in their lives, and how present and omnipresent it's becoming. Uh, we've had really great conversations with youth about that. Especially like energy drinks, big, uh, yeah, big yeah. coffee, especially. <clears throat> I'm not going to show that. So, all kinds of drugs that students are using. But this, two really important stats. So I just told you about, you've seen kind of all the drugs that kids are using. 43% is actually the, the percentage of youth in the Nova Scotia student drug use survey from last year that said they hadn't used any of the top three drugs, so alcohol, tobacco, or cannabis. So all this discussion about youth substance use is really important, but we have to keep in mind as well that a large number of students aren't using any substances at all. And I think that gets lost. We get this concern that all kids are doing drugs. On the other end of the spectrum, only 10% of students uh, surveyed said that they had used all three of those drugs, alcohol, tobacco, and cannabis. Um, so you have to keep that in, in mind, right, in terms of substance use. Yeah. Excellent point. Youth as defined like 14 to 18 or 18? So the Nova Scotia Student Drug Use Survey surveys youth from grade 7 to grade 12. Okay. Right? So that explains part of this, right? So when I'm saying 43%, <laughs> those students in grade 7 are not using a lot of substances. But by grade 12, um, they're using more so, right? Thank you. That's great. Just to contrast for youth and adults, so we have a lot of information about youth 
usage in Nova Scotia. We don't have as much information in terms of adult usage, but you can contrast um, what adults use are tend to be uh, alcohol, so adults are in blue, uh, high rates of alcohol use, uh, higher than youth use in terms of cigarette use, uh, but lower rates of cannabis use. Um, and you can see the contrast in terms of what students are using. And another stat that's, or another graph, another way of looking at it, is to, if you put all the substances that people are using, um, student usage in red, it's students who are experimenting and using a lot more. Now, adults are using some of these substances, but the numbers are so low, they don't warrant um, uh, being able to be charted. So they're less than 1% quite often. Um, I don't, they're not called prescription drugs, but they would include uh, non-medical stimulants and non-medical tranquilizers. That would probably be prescription drugs. So, any comments or, okay, great. And then it does that there. Now, an in, another interesting graph is um, Choices, which is an adolescent uh, substance use program, asked, uh, both students or the youth that they work with and their parents about how they were harmfully involved or what issues they were facing. So I think this is really interesting because this is for the same family of individuals where a parent, less than 5% of parents uh, felt that physical abuse was an issue for that youth. The youth themselves were up to 28%. So in terms of how people are perceiving um, their kids, for example. Now, these are kids who are, are already harmfully involved. They're al already engaged in treatment. Um, but their perceptions quite, quite often are very different than what their parents are seeing. So it's just something to be aware of in terms of the, the work that you do as well. Uh, in ter alcohol consumption, and I won't get into it a lot, but we can see the largest group who are um, consumers of alcohol in a hazardous way, either heavy monthly drinking or heavy weekly drinking, are young people 19 to 24. Not a really big surprise. What is a big surprise to me is that the second largest group are adolescents between 15 and 18 who are harmfully involved in alcohol consumption. Oh, this is the, so we've already had the talk around emergent drugs. This is what bath salts, this is an example of bath salts and how they were being sold. So you can see how somebody would be confused that they are actually bath salts. Um, and uh, we heard very briefly that they were available in Elmsdale at a variety store, a convenience store. They took them off the shelf as soon as they realized what they were. But this kind of thing does happen. Now, that was about three years ago now? Yeah, I think they were the same store that was selling salvia as well. Right. And this is what salvia looks like um, if, you, if you purchased it. Magic mushrooms or psilocybin and ecstasy. So those are kind of what adolescents in our area we're seeing a lot more of and prescription drug abuse as well. So what works when we're uh, working with adolescents or working with adults in terms of uh, best practices? So we make sure that the information that we're providing is both age and developmentally appropriate. So if I'm asked to talk to a group of school children about crystal meth, I would say no, because we don't see it in our community uh, in, in a large way. And it's not necessarily relevant to it. it it has the opposite effect. Instead of providing the information, it makes the drug kind of sexy to the individual or more interesting, individuals more curious about it. So I tend to talk about the, the top three drugs when I'm talking with adolescents. Um, understanding local situations and local use patterns are really important. Um, focusing on immediate social consequences for adolescents is really important. Um, you tell somebody that, tell a young person that, you know, 40 years of smoking may lead to lung cancer. It's not of particular interest to them, but if you talk, focus on the immediate consequences of substance use, that's really helpful. Um, and trying to provide balanced and accurate information. So scare tactics don't work, um, but providing fair information and balanced information is actually a great opportunity to have those discussions. Um, you know, the debates around cannabis are really interesting, and it's, I, for me, working with students, it's one of the most interesting conversations to have because it's an opportunity to break down myths and fallacies pretty quickly and provide kind of the information that we have. I just want to add to the balanced and accurate knowledge is, is one of our approaches I find works quite well. Um, and I'll give an example of a youth that I'm working with in one of the schools where uh, he was, I'll say, mandated from his mom to attend appointments to see me uh, for the first two times. And it was quite obvious he didn't want to be there at all. Um, you know, like a very withdrawn resistance and conversation and engagement. So, 
because the services are voluntary, then he has the option to, to, to leave. He doesn't have to stay. He definitely took the option the first time. Um, but however, his substance use was causing him problems in other areas of his life, such as you now he can't drive the car anymore and that sort of thing. So he came back a third time. It was actually today. Um, <coughs> I'll be honest, I wasn't very confident that it wasn't going to be any different than the first two times. Um, but he sat down and the first thing he said was, I just have one question. He said, what are, what are the health consequences of smoking marijuana? So we had a, a pretty good conversation about um, the, the fact is, for somebody his age, there are health consequences. So there, it can change your brain's development permanently. However, a lot of the research is showing that 25 and on, there is a short-term symptoms that can happen. But after the fact, they actually go back to, to normal. Um, I think that approach helped him me remain engaged in the conversation. Um, he didn't feel like I was going to say you shouldn't do drugs because this is how it's going to affect you and they're bad, so don't do them sort of thing. He's heard that quite a bit. Um, he's done a lot of his own research as well. And that was refreshing because sometimes we do talk to youth and there are other myths out there that well, marijuana is natural, it grows in the ground, it actually cures cancer. And we've heard that probably twice a year we do presentations for you that it actually cures cancer. Um, but it's also an opportunity for us to have that conversation and break down some of those myths that are there. Yeah. And kind of recognizing that drug use or mental health issues, and I focus specifically on drug use, um, are not a, a one-unit discussion, right? So I've been in this position for about eight years, and I used to be called drug guy, because <laughs> I would go to the schools, and I would do the drug presentation, and, oh, look, it's drug guy, because I'd be there every year. But really... Schools are getting a lot better, and we're getting a lot better about understanding the impact around substance use and trying to have that conversation throughout the year in different ways, in terms of including it in math and including it in science and including it in um, literature and all kinds of different areas. So I think that's been a really important learning for us. What, rather than doing one-off presentations, we tend to be doing longer-term um, uh, program. So we have a program called Challenge Accepted, and we're going to show you some examples uh, where we're working with students from grades 7 till 9, um, and really teaching them resilient skills, protective skills, better communication. So it's not necessarily just the substance use. It's all the stuff around the substance use that really what's going to help you prevent, prevent usage or delay usage as long as possible, right? Um, so I think I'm going to throw it over to you. Yeah. I have to stand really close to you. Do I still have to stand close? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> James. Yeah, sorry. Just, just a question. Um, oh, what, just. Has there been, what's the correlation between um, increased anxiety in, in the youth age and uh, substance abuse? And is it, you know, does one come before the other? Right. Or are there connections? It, it, it just seems like um, there's just so much more anxiety yeah. among that youth group in this generation in particular. And I, and I wonder, is that a reason for the increased substance abuse, or is it the other way around? Or it's hard to say. It is a real chicken and egg, right? There's been so much more awareness about anxiety and mental health issues, and that's been really great. But we've also seen a spike in terms of uh, adolescents and younger people coming forward um, saying that they're struggling with anxiety. So we have the discussion that so what's normal anxiety and what's, um, what's high anxiety? And what does that mean? So that's part of the discussion we have with youth. There is absolutely a correlation between um, anxiety, depression, other mental health issues. If, somebody is, if a young person or an individual is struggling with a mental health issue, um, uh, they will be more harmfully engaged in substance use as a coping mechanism among other issues. So there is certainly that. It reminds me of, I feel like I'm getting really old, but you know, 20, 25 years ago, Oprah Winfrey started talking about child abuse. And really quickly, the rates of individuals who came forward around child abuse spiked or skyrocketed. And people had the same discussion, like, is this all of a sudden new? Well, I think when you make information more widely available, a consequence of that, either positive or negative, is that more people understand what that means. So, you know, if I knew about social anxiety when I was 16, I would have told, oh, that's what's going on with me, or ADHD, or, you know, that kind of stuff. So I, that would be my, my quick answer. Does that resonate? Okay. Great. I would add a little bit, too, would be, uh, do you want me just to wear that? I or? would like you to wear that. You like <laughs> <laughs> uh, I kind of argue, I guess, too, that I think you face a lot more pressures than I did when I went to high school. Um, I also think that, that there's a lack of uh, to stop. Okay, time out. 
No, no, you can keep going. Oh, I thought you said. No, I, I asked him. Oh, okay. Okay. If you want to put that in your pocket. Sure. Does it matter which pocket? Uh, it doesn't have any. No, okay. no problem. This front one here. So he's finished talking about that. Yeah, you and you can't talk anymore. Okay, you start over again. <laughs> I'm Sean. Uh, we're <laughs> um, lack of coping skills. Uh, I where was I going with that? Now that kind of threw me off. What were we talking? Kids are facing a lot more stress today. Right. Kids are facing a lot more stress today. One of the things you said too is kids are presenting with anxiety. What what I see too is kids will present because people have told them you have a problem with alcohol, marijuana, and after we do a little bit of digging and have some conversations and maybe do an assessment. Uh, anxiety might actually be their problem. Uh, alcohol, marijuana is their solution to the problem, right? But people identify the substance use as their issue. Um, some of the struggle too is uh, some families are great to work with and some families don't feel that anxiety is a real issue. So, or, or depression is a real issue. So that, you know what, just suck it up and get over it. You know, like you, you don't smoke weed and you shouldn't feel depressed. That can be a really big challenge too. Um, and I think like you said, we're We've gotten better in identifying um, some of the issues that are out there and, and making some diagnoses as well, so that part has increased. But is there any, um, is there in fact higher levels of uh, drug uh, abuse and addiction than in the past? Than in the past? In terms of the student drug use survey, in terms of overall rates of usage, there's been very little change. The only change has been tobacco use, where 20 years ago, rates of tobacco use were about um, <laughs> about 35% for students, and now it's down to 12 or 13%. So we've done awesome work around that in terms of taking it from a public health approach. When it comes to alcohol and cannabis, those rates have, have pretty much flatlined. Alcohol is flatlined. Um, cannabis rates have gone up a little bit. But it's the an anecdotal information that we hear about things like prescription drug abuse or um, uh, designer drug use that we're hearing those rates are going up, but it's not being reflected in the stats. So why is that? We're not entirely sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna jump into the adventure-based learning piece. Uh, ABL, adventure-based learning, is an approach that we use, especially with adolescents and working with groups. Uh, and basically what we do is we present some challenges and then we have a discussion, either throughout the activity or after. Uh, I would say when I was younger and I did some of the youth work, volunteering, working with the Boys and Girls Club, I did some ABL without knowing it, but I didn't do the debriefing piece, which is really the most important part. It wasn't until I moved away and worked out west for a bit that uh, they used ABL quite a bit in their work with adolescents and I was able to get trained, that I kind of understood uh, the process itself and how to use it in groups. This is just an example. Uh, every year we've been able to so far do a, a program called High Stakes where we take a group of youth from the area. Uh, we go away for about four days and do some outdoor adventure therapy activities. Um, this particular group we actually had someone contracted out to do some of that work but since then we've had people on our staff trained to do it so we run it ourselves. Um, back then also we were tri-district so these are people from all over the tri-district area. So ABL and feel free to ask questions as we go. Uh, ABL challenges people to develop and practice new skills, both social and physical, and to connect with other group members. So like James said, um, when we do Challenge Accepted, basically what we do is we present the program to a school in junior high. Uh, they identify kids that could benefit, and these kids generally are at risk. So they might not be um, identified as, as uh, using substances. They may, but for the most part, any other kids that may be at risk, and the idea in that program they could be referred for resistance refusal skills. That's a big part of that program. Uh, social skills is a big one for some people. Communication, problem solving, uh, and of course, resiliency as well. And the one comment I want to make, so we're focusing and talking about adolescents uh, when we're talking about these programs, but we've used these activities with adults and they work as well, if not better. Um, so don't feel that this, um, this processor is, is just really limited to one population because it can be used throughout. And really, I think adults really like the, um, the opportunity to, to play a little bit, right? And to kind of get away from just sitting and, and listening. And certainly, the adult learners that you have have all kinds of different styles in terms of how they learn. So often getting up is really helpful for them. Mm -hmm. And that's a good point. When I, when I did work out West, um, the individual who brought that to our agency, ABL, was from PEI, but he had worked out there for about eight years, and he was an adult clinical therapist. So he used this with adults and a lot of family work as well. 
So it's, we're only going to touch on some of the activities that we do, but feel free to you know steal them and make them your own. A lot of the ideas that we have gotten over the last little while, people have just kind of suggested, well, you know what, I might be able to use this in my work doing this, and then we've stolen that for our homework as well. So. Yeah, Feel free to. It's, it's quite, Project Adventure is a great website, but there's a lot of websites. If you just Google it, activity uh, adventure based learning, mm -hmm. uh, it'll take you to all kinds of sites. And what I like about adventure based learning is that it encourages people to steal and adapt and make it your own and change it up and do mm -hmm. something different. It's not a rigid approach at all. It really provides um, the, the, the individual the tools to kind of develop their own programming. <coughs> Challenge, Challenge Unlimited is another good website. That's where I got my training. They're based out of Ontario. Uh, let's get that one. So ABL, uh, interdisciplinary groups. So there's two tasks that are accomplished. Uh, task and purpose and the opportunity for growth and building new skills. So ABL kind of takes it to that next level. Uh, and it provides the opportunity to create and maintain relationships with other group members. So it's a, it can be a fairly intensive program because uh, you know, in traditional groups, sometimes we sit down, we have discussions on certain topics, and people share or they don't share. ABL kind of breaks the ice a little bit with a lot of the activities, so people sometimes don't even realize that they're engaged in that sense, and they open up a little bit faster even than they would normally in some of those other groups that we've done in the past. Uh, so unlike traditional approach, ABL creates the opportunity to establish and maintain relationships with other members of the group. Let's chat about that. This was, I like this picture because this individual here was, um, I won't say resistant to attend the high stakes program, but he was fairly shy. Uh, I, don't, I mean, it was a bit of a challenge for him to get up the courage to come to the program. And this, what we do at the start of it is called, uh, what's that called? Constitution. No, it's definitely not called Constitution. <laughs> Group guidelines. So, <laughs> Constitution is kind of scary. So, Basically what we do is we get people to write down expectations they have from the program, from individuals, and from the leaders as well. And the one thing that he wanted was just to make friends in the group. And, and he was successful in that. But I like the picture because it was, this is, this is the first day, right? So he engaged within the first day and kind of opened up as to what he was hoping to get out of it, where I think if you would have asked him directly, I'm not sure if you would have shared that right away. It might have taken quite a while. <clears throat> Okay, common elements, uh, ABL is experiential in nature. So this is that challenge by choice piece. So like when James presented his activity, that was a good example of an icebreaker for adventure-based learning. Um, ask for volunteers, and even in the activity, you kind of know what you're getting yourself into. He didn't make everybody talk about why they were where they were. That was still optional, right? So in some of the activities we present, uh, it's challenge, they're all challenged by choice. So you don't have to participate fully, but you have to participate at a level that you're comfortable. That might mean just stepping back and supporting other people as they try some of the activities. As long as they're engaged, that's kind of all we ask. Yep. Oh, so we did this on the first day. No, we didn't do it. <laughs> this is what we work towards, ideally. And if you, if you take a look at the picture, who do you see supporting the youth? The youth, the youth yeah. That, that's ideal. That's what we work towards. So, when we do high stakes now, we, we don't do the high ropes course at Acadia, but we do go to Ontree, which is in Windsor. Um, kind of similar. There's, I mean, some of the, actually, they're a lot more intimidating, some of the obstacle courses. And it's so far so good. The last couple of years we've been there, um, we've, able to, we've been able to move the group through the development phases. We're at the very end of it, the last day. We're able, as facilitators, to step back, and, and they kind of take over that piece. So they're supporting each other. Um, we talk a lot about success. So. This particular day, uh, there was a, a couple individuals who felt that they failed because they weren't able to do this, walk all the way up. I wasn't able to do that either. Um, so we talked about success that night and what success looks like. They were able to, what you had to do was put a ladder, about a 10 foot ladder, and then climb up these pegs and then get up to the top, you know, balance yourself, walk across, walk back, and then you had to lean back, let go, and then somebody would lower you down. So because they weren't able to get up Halfway up the pole, they felt they failed. So all we really did was bring up what does success look like? You know, was everybody successful today? And that was pretty much all we did. The youth kind of took over the discussion at that point. And you know, long story short, they all deemed everybody was successful because part of it is trying, right? So trying is to push yourself a little bit, but also to realize when, okay, I'm out of my comfort zone, I have to stop right now, right? And that, that's fine. So that was how they deemed it a success. I thought it went really well. 
And I think, you know, you can relate that in terms of adult learning and somebody who's been out of the education system coming back and can be very intimidating for that individual. Mm -hmm. um, so to kind of celebrate the fact that you're, you're here, right? That's, and you guys do that all the time, I'm sure. But, you know, that, that opportunity is really important for people to hear and to kind of get the group to share with one another, right? Which mm -hmm. often happens with, with adult learning situations. Group development, ABL. Okay. So, ABL icebreakers. So these activities are generally what we start the groups with. We, I mean, we used to do an icebreaker every session, but the first two sessions, we generally do a lot of team building, right? So that involves a lot of icebreakers. So these activities provide opportunities for group members to get to know each other and to begin to feel comfortable with one another. So they're kind of low level, low threat, um, not, you know, not very intimidating. But what I'd like to do, if possible, is to get maybe uh, about six or eight individuals to volunteer. Uh, what you'll be volunteering for, we're going to try to juggle some items, maybe three or four as a group, so not individually, and just see how many we can handle without dropping them. And part of it is we're probably going to drop them, that's okay. It's just part of the process. So can I get five or six volunteers to come up and give us a hand? <laughs> okay. Oh, good. <laughs> You're not alone. I'll juggle them. <laughs> All right. I wonder. Maybe we'll spread out a little bit here more so people can see. Okay. So this is called group juggle. It's very simple. All you have to do is go to the dollar store and buy a bunch of items you can throw around. There's a lot of variations we've used over the years. So I'm going to run through actually what the icebreaker would look like, but then we're going to turn it up a notch. It's going to be the same activity, but I'm going to give you an example of how you might be able to apply it in some of your work. So basically what we would do is we would figure out an order of how we're going to juggle these items. So how it works is you throw it to one person. Uh, whoever I throw it to is the same person I'm going to throw each item to every time. Whoever throws it to me, that's who I'm going to receive it to from every time. So we're going to figure out an order, and then once it comes back to me, that's our order. Okay? What's your name? Karina. Trina? Karina. Karina. Okay, I'm going to throw it to Karina. Okay, and you just throw it to someone different than me. Anybody besides me or Karina? Yeah, so we'll raise our hand. Whoever's already gotten it, just raise your hand. And that way you know to throw it something different. Christine? Christine? Oh, oops. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I said one. And Dana? And James, I think. Okay. So I know that I'm thrown to Karina and James is thrown to me. Does everybody remember their order? Yes. Okay. So. <laughs> You're lucky we didn't do this with the whole group. Yeah, it takes, it takes a lot longer with the whole group. So just, okay, this is just off the top of my head. Give me some examples of some stressors that the population you work with could be facing when you're working with them. Money. Money, okay. Money. This object right here is going to represent money, okay? What's another example? Health. What was it? Health. Health, okay. Health, someone said something in the back? Mental health, perfect. That's going to be the lion, okay? Broken cars. Broken cars. Transportation. I'll uh, we'll get the frog out there. So we get time. Children. Oh, children. Okay. We okay. So we got time, children. You guys remember the stressors, right? No. No. Okay. So what we're going to do now? We were able to juggle that one stressor pretty good, right? Didn't have too much of a problem with it, okay? So what we're going to do now? Okay. Do you guys remember the order? You want a practice run? Yeah, do a run. Practice, practice run? <laughs> what's Who, what's the frog? Does anybody remember? Transportation. Okay, transportation. We're going to do transportation one. See if we can handle it, okay? Here's our stressor. Oh, that's pretty good. So we can handle transportation, okay. So with all these supports in place, Transportation is something we can manage. What was the line? Children. Children. That's a big one. That should be two. What's this one? Health. Health. Health and the other one was mental health. Mental health? health? What was that one? Green is money. Green's Green's money. Tiger was mental health. Okay, let's try these four right here, these four stressors, okay? <laughs> there we go. So same order, same thing. Karina. 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 Oh. Karina. 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 
Maria. <laughs> Maria. Sharina. Maria. Sorry, my wires. Maria. 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 All right, hold on. Okay. How do you feel, Karina? <laughs> okay. So, quick question for the people in the group: How are we feeling right now? Stress. Relax. Actually, we handled it pretty well. We did handle it pretty good for a little bit. And then what? And then, and then what happened? Started have collisions. Started have collisions. So a few hiccups, and then what happened after that? One stood off one. Okay, so we got overwhelmed. And you were my example because I was kind of loading you up. <laughs> so with that said, I mean, one we were able to manage. How many do we have now? I got three, four, five, six, seven, okay? What do you think a reasonable number is for this group to manage stress-wise? I think we did four or five, actually. Four or five? As long as there was a rhythm. Okay. Because once we were watching for yep. it, right, it's when the little congestion happened. But I think four or five. Okay. So but let's go for four, okay? So let's talk about, what's this, well, hold on, which one do we want to get rid of? Frog is transportation. Do you guys want to get rid of this guy? That's transportation. I like the frog, okay. Transportation. <laughs> let's do some brainstorming. For, so for some of the stressors, transportation might be one for the population you work with. What are some potential solutions for some of the clients, or, or sorry, the people that you work with, with regards to transportation and how that affects them? If there's somebody driving, they can find another person. Okay. Carpooling, yep. Our, our organization has uh, another wing that's uh, community transportation, community rider that supports. Right. Yeah. Community rider, yep. Yeah. What else? Budgeting for a bus pass. Budgeting for a bus pass. So budgeting, yep. They could check in via email and say, "I was working on this and I had that problem. I got to stay home today, but can you help me with this?" Yep. Communication, yep. We have a taxi service that coordinates with ours. So it's a matter of them understanding when they're available and so on, because sometimes they could be a little behind, but right. at least if they understand the timing, they okay. can use that. Okay. Any other suggestions? Not an option, right. <coughs> okay. Okay. So I feel like maybe we've alleviated this problem a little bit. We brainstormed a little bit, so we're going to set this one aside. Which one would we like to get rid of? Is there any problem ones here juggling? Money. Money. Money, yeah. Okay. <laughs> money. So give me some ideas of, of uh, well, I guess stressors money-wise, how that situation can be dealt with. Not, you're not going to get rid of the solution as a whole, but how can you minimize it? How can clients minimize it? Budgeting. Budgeting is huge. So budgeting courses. Yeah. Okay. So don't, don't make people buy a whole big bunch of school supplies. Don't make them supply their own calculator, yep. that kind of stuff, that you're not adding to that burden. So, so part of that's being client-centered as well, right? Yeah. Like yeah. understanding the issues. Okay. Yep. Other ideas? Lower your standards. Lower your standards? Or lower, lower your wants. I, I mean, yep. if you have to work within a, you have to, you know, just take care of your needs and the necessities. Mm-hmm. And sometimes helping people understand, you know, what's a want and what's a need, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. Also, yeah. Information sharing that if your agency knows of other community-based agencies that just do have funding that right. is available. Yeah. Then there are a lot of our learners that don't know it. Right. So okay. by informing them, okay, well, you've got this problem, you can go to that person or yeah. you can go to that agency. So once they understand that there are available resources, they can tap into it. Right. Perfect. Okay, we're going to set money aside. We have one more. That one's hard to catch. Okay, what did that one represent? Health. Health. That's a big one. Okay, so think about some of the population you work with. Um, what are some ways to minimize uh, some of the issues that come up with regards to health? Education. Education, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. How to read nutrition labels? Yep. Yeah. You can get like a healthy eating brand. You have food there. Yeah. Snacks. You have 
Okay, so being proactive, applying for a grant, and having the resources available. Yeah. And in our agency, where we do have a grant that provides um, like lunch program, not to be embarrassed about it. Right. But to be able to say, hey, this is provided for me, and I'm going to utilize it. You know, and even if you can extend it, saying we've got extra here, and we have people who do provide things. Yeah. They often will say, take those home. For right. Kids and that. So again, it's overcoming that feeling of uh, being self-conscious yeah. about it. And just say, hey, I need it, so I can tap into it. Right, it's there. Yeah. yeah. Great. Any other suggestions? Networking yeah. Network with other community-based agencies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Great. So we're gonna put this one aside. Okay. So I'll start over. I'll take the. Uh, is this two? <laughs> I'll tell you. I'll start over. I'll, I'll start the. Yeah. Oh, here we go. So just three? Oh, we got rid of it. Okay. Oh, wow. Well, let's do three. That was good. All right. You ready? Karina. Karina. Oh, all right. Karina. Whoops. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Karina. Nice job. Um, oh, yeah, it's coming. <laughs> all right. Quick round of applause for everybody that participated. Good job. You can grab a seat there. Thank you. So that was a really long, drawn-out example of an icebreaker. Um, we use this activity a lot of times just to get to know people. So I know Karina now very well because I was saying her name every time I threw it to her. Um, so we get people to say their names, right? What we do is we'll overload them and get them to brainstorm. Okay, how many do you want to juggle? Let's set a goal. Is it realistic? And then how are we going to be able to accomplish that? And a lot of times that means we got to slow down, we got to say names, we got to say eye contact. So we now all of a sudden problem solving is incorporated, uh, communication, cooperation, those sort of things in the very first activity. But it's an icebreaker too. But even with that activity, it started as an icebreaker, but then it moved to another level. So we got a little bit more in depth where we started talking about what stresses people have, how we can start to resolve them, getting the, the group to identify um, solutions. So, you know, those are opportunities there where mm -hmm. you're not just doing an icebreaker, you're actually moving forward yeah. in terms of the program. And there are solutions that people in our groups come up with that we wouldn't have thought about because we don't know what resources they're aware of, but they have available to them as well, right? Okay. Um, some youth will talk about, like, if we're doing something on anger, you can uh, say, you know, what are some things that trigger anger? Or what are some things that trigger substance use? So we will overwhelm them with all the objects and then we'll take some back and brainstorm us. Okay, how can we alleviate the trigger of stress or the trigger of, you know, if you get a low grade or, you know, something goes on at home, that sort of thing. What are some things you can do? And that's why we set it aside. It's not to say that that problem's now been solved. It's just here are some strategies to try to, uh, you know, implement in your own life and let's see if it works and come back and then we'll talk about it, sort of thing. <clears throat> Uh, communication activities. So these activities provide an opportunity for group members to develop their ability and skills to communicate with other members of the group. I really picked that activity for that one. Okay, yeah. So communication and icebreakers, I, that's why I did it the, the two different. So the icebreakers would have been just, you know, a couple objects getting to know each other, the names, and then communication is where we decide, okay, how many do we want to try to to juggle, how are we going to be able to do it, and then having a conversation about some of the stressors for the population you work with. The next level uh, would be group problem solving activities. So these activities provide an opportunity for group members to develop effective problem skills uh, as a group through recognizing and utilizing strengths of all group members. This is something we would do later on in the group development process. So Challenge Accepted is an eight week program that we do we would probably start some of these activities either midway to the second half of that session. Uh, however, today, we're going to do it right now. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to look for, if possible, another five to six volunteers. It could be the same people or if new people want to try it. What we're going to do for this activity, um, we're going to get a, the tent pole out. Yeah, I'm going to do that one. I am. So we're going to do the tent pole. People are going to line up, and James and I will give an example with your fingers out, and the goal is, uh, once we put the tent to pull across the fingers, is to lower it to the ground. That's the goal. How simple could that be? What could possibly go? <laughs>
Somebody could lose an eye. Somebody can. This only happened twice. Uh, if we get a couple more, that'd be great. Or four more would be even better. Wow. Okay. Okay. So we'll get half on one side and half on the other side. Yeah, even number on each side. Okay. I'm going to I'm going to stay on the outside. Yeah. So if you put if you're going to be here, so what you'll do, you put your finger. Oh, sorry, you come over here. So fingers go like this, and your one finger go in between mine. So right here. Yep. And then one maybe right there, sort of. Thing. Okay. So that's what. Yeah. There you go. Perfect. Okay. So the way this works. Now this is a this can be a real trust activity as well. I'll explain that later. Yeah. Okay, that's okay. So your goal is to lower it to the ground. Now, your fingers are to stay straight and in contact at all times. If you lose contact, you have to regain contact as quick as you can. Um, and it's a group activity. So as a group, you have to lower it to the ground. Okay, and your mark, it's set, go. We're going to lower it? We're going to lower it. All right, start to uh, bend in your knees. <laughs> <laughs> okay. oh, you guys are All right, on your mark, get set, lower your hands. There we go. There we go. Now remember, if you lose contact, you got to regain contact with your fingers. Go back up. Somebody's going back up. Back up. <laughs> Everybody just let go. Is that what <laughs> 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 Is this a trick tent? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you the real name of the activity once it's on the ground. That's pretty good. You guys can drop it there. <laughs> All right, quick round of applause. Now, I'm going to talk to the group members first before you guys grab a seat. I want to ask, you guys actually did this quite, quite quickly compared to some of the other groups that we've done it with. Um, but what are some things that you experienced or noticed in this activity? Anything? Some people were scared. How so? To take the first step to say, this is what we do. Okay. So that leadership role? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What else? Mm -hmm. And it's a nonverbal thing. Yep. So everybody seemed to think it should be going down, but nobody seemed to be bringing it down. <laughs> <laughs> well, and how do we... How do Maybe we... I'm speaking the obvious. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some things that were said when it wasn't going down? It was going up for a little bit. What were you guys saying to each other? I don't know if you noticed or not. You guys going to do it. Yeah, I heard somebody... <laughs> Somebody's not lowering it. There's a little bit of blame that happened, right? A few times. Somebody is not lowering it. Somebody, is this a trick poll, I think, right? Like, it was. It was, yeah. So this activity is actually called helium pole. And it's not because there's helium in the pole. It's just a regular temp pole. But what happens in the activity, I mean, as soon as you lose contact, you regain it, you'll add pressure, right? So it goes up and up and up. But what you notice in the activity is people start to get upset. Not so, I mean, this was pretty good. I made the mistake, and sequencing is key in ABL. Um, you can grab a seat if you want, and then I'll continue the chat there. Yeah, go ahead and pause. So I made the mistake when we did, um, we did Addictions 101. It's now Mental Health and Addictions 101, and it's where we have people from the community come and just kind of learn about our services and our approach. I made the mistake of doing an activity called Sieve Addictions. Basically, what we do is we lay out all kinds of different substances that people could become addicted to. Uh, we blindfold somebody, get them to walk through the sea of addictions, um, and there's variations of it. On each side will be people that are telling them to go in different directions. Because they're blindfolded, they're trying to rely on them as to which way to go. However, we set up the activity so some of those people are negative influences, they don't know that. So they might be trying to guide them into certain things, and then we have a discussion about peer pressure and stuff like that after. So I did that activity first, and then I did this activity. And in that activity, there was one individual, uh, because it actually took quite a while to do, we went into lunch and they didn't finish it, they were dead set that I had sabotaged the activity, that I had gotten somebody in the group 
to keep rising the pole. And I, <laughs> I couldn't convince him for the rest of the day that that wasn't the case. Um, so sequencing is key. I, I forgot that rule that day. And I, and I think one of the things that made this work really easily, because mm -hmm. usually, like it often takes five, 10 minutes. People can get really frustrated and upset with one another. That's why you don't want to start with an activity like this. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a smaller group, and I think it was easier to coordinate. We've yeah. done this, when you do this with 20 or 30 people, yeah. you can imagine how much uh, people are, are, are moving around, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's partly why this worked really well. Yeah. It was great, but you also worked really, coor you coordinated really well. So whether you know each other or not, you, you do this work, so you're able to kind of recognize some of that. That's what I saw. Mm -hmm. And it's a good example of, of how we respond to, to, to pressure, right? Like if you think of that as like a meter of pressure and stress going up, uh, I'm one of those people that would start blaming people for sure. I think <laughs> I'd probably become upset, you know what I mean? Like, so it's one of those things we learn a bit about ourselves as well, and, and people reflect on that, and sometimes that they want to make some changes in that sense, right? So that was, you guys did really well with communication, and, and it shows resiliency as well. Because a lot of times when that starts to go up, I mean, you'll see some people just go, this is impossible. It's not going to happen. We can't do it, right? But you guys are able to bounce back and lower it to the ground. So it went pretty well. Yeah. OK. I'm glad it did, because sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> uh, trust activities. So these activities provide opportunities for group members to develop support and skills and belongingness with the group. So trust, we will do generally with that high stakes program we talked about some light trust activities the morning of, and then the afternoon we'll do stuff like you saw with the high ropes course. Um, generally, like I said, by that day on the Friday, the last day of the program, um, trust, they've developed a sense of trust, uh, you know, a strong bond as a group, and they're able to support each other effectively. I do have one activity for trust. Um, to give you an example, this one is called, it's called turn over a new leaf, but again, there's variations of it. What we're gonna do is lay out a tarp on the floor uh, we'll get hopefully again about six to eight volunteers. You're going to stand on the tarp and as a group your goal is to flip the tarp over and be standing on the other side but without any body part or anything actually touching the floor. So the trust in this sense is that you're going to have to work together. You might be in close quarters. Uh, there's definitely some communication and cooperation that has to occur. I brought the big tarp, yeah. <laughs> So it shouldn't be too, too bad. If we get six, around six to eight people uh, with a tarp that size, it shouldn't be too, too bad. Who'd like to try? Okay. Yeah, I'll explain it more when we get. So basically, you're going to stand on the tarp. And your goal is to be standing on the other side. You're going to flip the tarp over completely, but you can't touch any part of the floor. Can you touch the tarp with your Oh, Yeah, you can touch the tarp. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Um, I don't think it's going to work with only two. <laughs> <laughs> groups are at size, we, we tend to shoot for at least, well, around 10 is probably our average. Um, six to eight, that, even six to eight, that's a bit of a bigger tarp. Takes a lot more communication. Um, I, we haven't done it with challenge accepted, but I have used this activity before to talk about um, the pros and cons of substance use or pros and cons of even a decision. Um, or this is who I am right now and this is who I want to be. Uh, and we do that as a group, so we brainstorm different uh, characteristics or goals that people have things that they'd like to, behaviors they'd like to stop doing or change. And then we put all the kind of negatives on that one side and they want to flip that over. They want to get to the other side. So as a group, they have to work towards how to get to the, where they want to be, basically. 
and they work together by doing that. And we talk about by working together, sometimes that means accessing supports and what do supports look like for you. And everybody's, some people have very limited supports, if any. Some people have lots of supports. So, and then it gives us a discussion to talk about how we can play a role in that and the supports that we're aware of in the, in the communities as well. And another trust activity that we do, and I'll just I'll, I'll, discuss, I'll talk about it. We were I'm sure in terms of time, and, and some of these activities, as you can imagine, take a fair amount of time. But you can see on this side of the tarp, it, it's uh, squared off. Mm -hmm. There's actually an activity that we do um, in which there's a maze. And people have to go from one end to the other, but it's not it's not clear how that's done. So every time, <laughs> if they're walking on the tarp. Uh, they're doing fine, but if they make a, state, a mistake and they go in the wrong direction, they get the oh, I see that. <laughs> and then they have to stop and start over again. But it goes from individual to individual, so you can imagine, so you can see how they actually have to start to work as a group and communicate with one another about how to take the steps to get to the end. And I don't think they're allowed to speak. Obviously. No, they're not. Yeah. The trust activity not verbally. you're asking them to go up another level, right? So a fairly simple activity is just to get them to explain it to one another. But if they're not speaking, they have to be able to help one another um, without using a normal type of communication. So again, think about that. You think about it in the larger context about somebody who wants to move from one place in their life to another place in their life. How are they going to do that? And how are they going to get support from the people around them? All that kind. Those are the great discussions that start to happen. So, you know, the, there's the work of the activity, but it's the work of the debrief that's really where the opportunity comes up to kind of make change for individuals. Mm -hmm. Yep. When you say it's an eight-week program, is it a program that they're attending daily? No, week? sorry, just once a week. Yeah, so eight hours in total. So just an hour a week. Right? Hour a week, yeah. Part of that program, too, challenge accepted for our purposes, is to become engaged with the population that has been somewhat resistant to. So the school may have identified a few or many students that they want to access our services, but you know, we're the drug people, we're going to tell them what they should and shouldn't do, or tell their parents what they're up to. So it gives us an opportunity to show them how we work and our approach, but also to explain our limits of confidentiality and, and the fact that we don't share information with parents unless there's that risk of someone being hurt. Um, yeah, so it wasn't long ago that we would, you know, we would do a group and the teachers or the guidance would send down all the kids they think. Um, but we try to give that power back to the individual. So the teacher may call them down, but we'll say, you don't have to come if you don't want to. It's voluntary, mm -hmm. but this is the kind of stuff we'll do, and you get an hour off. So it tends to work really easy. So we get that buy-in from the very beginning, right? Yeah. Yeah, I've been doing this type of work for this this programming for about nine years, nine or ten years now, and every year, about twice a year, we do this type of group. And there's only been one individual in that time frame that, after they tried it the first session, they came to me after and said, "I don't think this is for me." So that's usually all we ask. That okay, it is challenged by choice. Our groups are voluntary. If you're still on the fence, then come and try the first session. If you still don't think it's for you at the end of the day, then the, you don't have to come. You just go back to class. Um, that's usually the kicker. Right? Yeah. I don't want to go back to class. <laughs> Oh, group developments. Um, so yeah, I should have linked those together. So group developments, we have storming. So that's at the very start. Individuals are trying to figure out how they fit within the group. Um, that one's, that's trust. Yeah. Uh, storming. So participants look for things they have in common with others and start to develop boundaries. That's when we do a lot of those icebreaker activities, so kind of low threat. Um, people get to know each other. Uh, norming, participants begin to communicate directly with one another, begin to problem solve and work together. That group juggle was a good example of that as well, where we had a lot of communication and problem solving kind of built in that activity. Uh, performing, that's the end goal really. So participants are able to independently problem solve as a group from the leader and their process to, as opposed to tasks focused. Um, and hopefully this is kind of an idea. So this is an activity where Participants had to work together. They climbed up, uh, I think it was a two or three foot tower. You can't tell right there, but it was like a telephone pole. They had to balance themselves, lean back, uh, and then eventually let go. And their own group members were the ones that were kind of lowering them down. Um, and that was self-driven. They, they ran that activity on their own. And then transforming. So by properly debriefing, and that's really the key, is the, com the, the conversations that take place in the activities and making it applicable but there are times where we have an agenda this is we we think this is where the discussion is going to go with these activities 
and then it goes in a totally different direction. And that's not necessarily a bad thing at all. Um, sometimes it kind of catches us off guard, but it, it's, it's, it's great, you know, if we can get that type of, of engagement, then we're ahead of the game. Uh, so just to wrap up, two key points. So again, there's the facilitating and then the conversation that happens afterwards, the debriefing, the activities. Uh, and we touched on that. So each activity has its own unique learning outcome, but sometimes there's unexpected ones and they're welcome as well. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thanks. Thank you.